been a very sad week for America, an atrocious act of pure evil, a gunman in Las Vegas mowing down hundreds of country music concert attendees, murdering 59 in cold blood and injuring far more, the largest mass murder shooting in American history, a crime of monstrous wickedness. What is happening in our country? What's going on? I lived through the turbulent 60s. That dates me. But never did we have mass shootings as we've seen in recent years, in recent decades. This horrendous event piles on top of the recent killer hurricanes and, and floods that ravaged Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico. We've seen racial and political tension and division and gang violence. We see the threat of nuclear attack, an actual head of state threatening to attack the United States of America with a nuclear weapon. America is being assaulted by a lethal plague of evil, and the remedy seems to have eluded us. What is happening to our country? Where is God in all of this? What is he saying to us today? Well, this morning I would like to respectfully offer a positive path forward, a path that, if followed, will make a radical difference in our lives and in the life of this country. It's no bright idea of mine. I didn't make it up. It's been around for thousands of years. And it has seen success everywhere it's gone. It, it, is, it works every time it's tried. Scripture has pointed to this path since the days of its writing. We're going back in time this morning, 2,700 years, to illustrate one example of this path. It took place about 6,000 miles from here, mostly in the city of Jerusalem, in the kingdom of Judah, led by the nation's most wicked king ever, one of the most evil men in the Bible. His name was King Manasseh, and he was a devil. He led his kingdom into a downward spiral of wickedness and rebellion, so abysmal that God's judgment was unavoidable. And yet, as bad as Manasseh was, he also illustrates for us the remedy for evil. The title of this morning's message is The Power of of repentance. God has provided all humans with an escape hatch from evil, even the most vile and monstrous evil. And that escape hatch is repentance. Repentance activates a power infinitely more mighty than even the most potent wickedness. And that power is the power of the cross of Jesus Christ, who took the evil of this world upon himself when he died for us on the cross and then three days later arose from the dead. Today, as we study Manasseh's startling story, we learn how to activate this power in ourselves and in our nation. Now, I invite you to get your outline out of your program if you haven't already done so, so you can take notes and follow along. We begin with our main idea. The one thing you should remember if you forget everything else that I say, and I hope you're taking notes because you will want to write it down. It goes like this. God's remedy for monstrous evil is real repentance. We're going to look this morning at four paces on the path of repentance. And this is essentially Manasseh's 
story. You see on your outline there four R's down the left-hand side of your outline. We're going to look at those together, and you'll see how this progressively works. The first of the four R's, the first pace on the path of repentance is rebellion. Now picture a path, if you will, leading up to God's door, from you to God. You are on that path. The rebellion we're talking about this morning is not rebellion against your parents or the government, although it could include that, but ultimately what we're talking about today is rebellion against God. And so on this path, rebellion is a step away from God. It's a step in the opposite direction. It's moving against God, not for God. Actually, according to Scripture, we are all natural rebels. We're born heading away from God. We're born sinners. We're not heading towards God when we come into this world. We're heading away from Him. But King Manasseh wasn't just walking away. He was running in the opposite direction. He was a descendant of King David, whose life we just studied a few months back. And as you may remember, David was appointed king of Israel by God himself. And he was to rule by a sacred covenant that God made with David. He was to rule on God's behalf. He was to be God's representative on earth, ruling the kingdom. And each of his descendants was to do likewise. But not so for King Manasseh. Manasseh rules by his own rules. We're looking today at 2 Chronicles chapter 33. So if you want to look that up in your Bible, you can do so. But we're also going to put the passage up on the screen so you can follow along with me when we come to the yellow print. All right? We begin 2 Chronicles chapter 33 at verse 1. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. Now, I should explain that. It wasn't like you had a, a teenager on the throne of Judah. Well, you did in a way, but he was probably co-reigning with his dad for the first 10 years or so. So he comes into this position of power at the age of 12. It says he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations. He rebuilt pagan shrines that his father, Hezekiah, had broken down. He constructed altars for the images of Baal and set up Asherah poles. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. He built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord, the place where the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh even took a carved idol he had made and set it up in God's temple, the very place where God had told David and his son Solomon, my name will be honored forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. But Manasseh led the people of Judah and Jerusalem to do even more evil than the pagan nations the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel entered the land. The Lord spoke to, them, to Manasseh. That would be through the prophets. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people 
but they ignored all his warnings. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. The kingdom of Judah had seen some mighty wicked kings in its history, but Manasseh, he was the worst. For starters, the sheer length of this guy's reign was unheard of back in those days. Fifty-five years on the throne, longer than any other king of Judah or Israel. And ironically, Manasseh's father, Hezekiah, had been a very good king, a very godly king. But his son, Manasseh, was a beast. Chief among Manasseh's crime was his deep dive into full-fledged idolatry, the worship of false gods. And this brought with it many, many vile practices. And it was in direct violation of his coronation covenant with the one true God, Yahweh, the Lord, to never permit any form of idolatry Uh, but to stay faithful to the one true God in his kingdom. But Manasseh wasn't content to simply worship idols. No, sir. He even brought idols into the holy temple itself. This was God's sacred space. This would be like a husband bringing another woman into the very bed in which he sleeps with his wife. I mean, it wasn't just adultery. It was adding injury to uh, uh, insult. Manasseh, Manasseh is evil on steroid. He is spitting in God's face. He is flipping God the bird. But even this wasn't enough for this vile man. We're told in verse 6 that Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire. Yes, Child sacrifice. This is really disturbing, folks. Really, really vile. This was a pagan ritual in which the so-called worshiper would stand before this huge stone idol. And the idol had in its carved-out belly a fire that was burning and outstretched arms and hands. And that fire, of course, would heat those arms and that those hands up to to the point where they were red hot. And when that happened, then the, the, the worshiper would place his own child onto those burning hot hands, a living child, and watch it just be roasted alive to satisfy the God. This was a monstrous evil. And Manasseh did this more than once. We're told that he sacrificed his sons, plural, this way. Manasseh wasn't just sort of accommodating himself to paganism. He was a true believer in it. He had to be in order to perform this kind of a sacrifice. But even this wasn't enough. We're told in 1 Kings that Manasseh also murdered many innocent people in Jerusalem until it was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. That's out of First Kings chapter, or Second Kings, excuse me, twenty-one sixteen. Manasseh was not a respecter of human life. He would kill people that just annoyed him, and chief among these would be godly people, people that tried to warn him, like prophets who would say, you need to turn or God's judgment is going to come upon you just as the covenant promises. God's covenant says there is discipline for this kind of a thing. You've got to turn around. You've got to repent. Jewish tradition tells us that one of Manasseh's victims was Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah, the great prophet, the greatest of the writing prophets. We're told in the Talmud, that Manasseh ordered Isaiah sawn in half while he was still living. 
Now, Manasseh, of course, was not a pagan king by birth. He, he was a descendant of King David. He was raised on God's Word. You remember, his, his father was a good and godly man, and Manasseh likely co-reigned with him. For 10 years, he was, he was exposed to the very, very best. Manasseh knew way better. This was defiance, pure and simple. Here in the United States, our nation, vaguely similar, to the kingdom of Judah. We're not Israel, folks. We're not Judah. But our nation, like Israel, like Judah, was founded upon a solid biblical foundation. God's natural law was the basis of our Constitution. Do not let the historical revisionists fool you on this. Go back to the original documents and you will see that our nation was founded on these biblical principles. But we have strayed away from this. Of course, it's true that we've had wicked practices in our nation back from the very founding days. Like, for instance, the terrible, evil, despicable practice of slavery. But folks... Everybody else in the world had slavery too. It wasn't like the United States was the first one who thought this up. It was going on everywhere. In fact, when we came here to the United States, when we came here to America, the Native Americans were practicing slavery. Everybody basically was practicing slavery. But we, following Great Britain, led the world in abolishing slavery. And why did we do that, folks? We did it because we could see. We had to do it. It was inconsistent with our basic principles. That's what led us to uh, abolish slavery. But today, we have lost sight of God. We've kicked Him out of the classroom, out of the schools. We've chased Him out of the public square. We've defiled our nation with atrocious immorality. We've dismissed God, we've rejected God, and then when something like Las Vegas happens, you got people saying, well, where was God? Blaming God. We gasp in horror at the ancient practice of child sacrifice, and rightly so. But here in the United States, we are the second largest abortion provider in the world second only to China. Abortion snuffs out a child's life, often in the name of convenience and economic viability, and the child can feel it. You can see this on an ultrasound. You can see this, the child trying to get away. It's painful for the child. This is slaughtering children. God help us. Like Manasseh, we've lost our fear of God, and with that has gone our value for human life. In his place, we've put other gods, the gods of money and sex and pleasure. And too often, we as God's people, we've been asleep at the wheel, we're so busy trying to fit in rather than stand out for Him. Rebellion. Let's look at the second pace on the path of repentance. The second R is repercussions. Rebellion against God is always costly. Repercussions always come sooner or later especially when there's no repentance. Look at 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11. So, as a consequence, the Lord sent the commanders of the Assyrian armies, and they took Manasseh prisoner. They put a ring through his nose, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. 
I know some uh, wear nose rings today, some here at Stony Creek Church. Well, this is not the style that you want, all right? Assyria, just to give you some historical background, was the most powerful kingdom on earth at the time, uh, located in what today we call Iraq. Manasseh had cooperated with Assyria. He was uh, good friends with the king. They, they got along, but somehow he angered the king, probably Asher Banapal. We don't know exactly what he did, but he must have offended him in some way. And so Manasseh was yanked off of his throne and dragged in chains hundreds of miles away to Babylon as if he were a beast. Manasseh goes from being the top man in his kingdom, living in the lap of luxury, to living as a farm animal. And notice that it's the Lord who's behind all of this. In verse 11 there it says, the Lord sent the Assyrians to do this. The Assyrians thought that they were just, you know, disciplining, punishing a a rebellious king, a wayward king, but behind the scenes, this was God's doing. There are always repercussions, and sometimes if we won't listen in times of blessing, times of judgment, tough times must come. Some Christians are wondering, could these terrible disasters, could these hurricanes and the flooding and the horrible violence, the shootings, the gang violence, the racial, political division, and the terrorism in our country be God's judgment upon us here in the United States. Did you know Abraham Lincoln, probably our greatest president, believed that the Civil War, all the blood that was shed in the Civil War, was God's judgment on America for the sin of slavery. Read his second inaugural, one of the greatest speeches ever delivered in our country. That was his belief. Could these recent horrors be God's judgment on America for the the sins that uh, we have partaken in? Sixty million babies. Yes, that's what it adds up to now, folks, since 1973. 60 million babies aborted, and and many other evils. To this, I would like to say two things. Could this be God's judgment on America? Well, first of all, let's remember that judgment is up to God, not us. In Bible times, you had prophets, infallible spokespeople, that would say this is a judgment of God or that famine or earthquake or whatever it may be is God's judgment upon our nation for not listening to the terms of the covenant. But we're not in that position. Our God-given role is to show God's mercy, even if it is a case of judgment which we cannot finally say, that's up to the Lord. We're here to show God's love and His mercy and to tell the truth, to point the way to the Savior. That's our God-given role. Of course, we need to remember that many godly people have died or have been very badly affected by these recent uh, terrible things that have happened in our country. So we need to be very, very careful before we start pointing the finger like that, unless you're an infallible prophet of God. Secondly, God is giving us a wake-up call. I believe we can say this with a fair amount of certainty. God is saying, wake up! Repent! Turn back to me. And of course, this needs to begin with us, folks. It always begins with the people of God, God's people, Christ's church. We need to lead the way. We need to be crying out to God 
for repentance and for revival and for spiritual awakening. My fear is that we are not hungry enough for this. Oh, yeah, those people lost their homes down there in Florida. Well, somebody was shot in Las Vegas. Well, I didn't know anybody who was killed there. doesn't affect me. We need to be desperate, folks, desperate. We need to have that hunger. We always see this before revival, a great hunger a great humbling on the part of God's people to turn to Him and to pray for the nation. Let's look at the third pace on the path of repentance, and that is repentance itself. Repentance is a word we hardly use anymore in our daily speech. It's a religious-sounding word. It sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? Even, even many churches and pastors are avoiding it because it just sounds too scary. We don't want to frighten anybody away. But properly understood in its biblical context, this is a hugely positive word, folks. Repentance means to turn away from evil and to turn towards God. That's very positive. You do an about face. You stop walking away from God. And you turn to God and walk towards Him. And incredibly, long as the odds sound against it happening, it, it's precisely what Manasseh did. Look at uh, chapter 33, beginning at verse 12. It says, while in deep distress, while in deep distress, this is what it took. To bring this man to his senses. While in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. I want you to notice two words that are in this passage particularly. I forgot to underline them. Sought and humbled. Remember those two words. Sought and humbled. He sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. Help me on verse 13. And when he prayed, the Lord listened to him and was moved by his request. The Lord listened and was moved. This moved the very heart of God. Awesome can put chills up my spine, bring tears to my eyes. Even the vilest sinner need only humble himself in sincere repentance, and God will graciously forgive. You know, I collect true stories of sincere repentance, of infamously evil people, people who have sought God, who have humbled themselves and repented and turned to Christ to forgive them and save them. Serial killer Ted Bundy, maybe you've heard of him before, horrible, horribly wicked man. He came to Christ before he was executed. Serial killer David Berkowitz, also known as the New York Son of Sam killer, terrorized New York in the 70s. He is a Christian. Serial killer David Berkowitz, named him. Serial child killer Wesley Allen Dodd, child killer, came to Christ before he was executed. Serial cannibalistic killer Jeffrey Dahmer, maybe the most infamous of them all, is to kill his victims and then eat them. He came to know the Lord and was transformed. Murderer, Carla Faye Tucker, she was executed in Texas, but before she was, she turned her life over to the Lord. Mafia gangster Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Papania, many others, many, many others. These are just a few examples. And it goes to show that God can save anyone. It goes to show us, never give up, never give up praying for 
to that unsaved friend or relative that just seems like so unlikely to convert. Now, perhaps you say, but how could God ever forgive such monstrous wickedness? One man said to me right down here some time ago, you mean a terrorist can just repent? Somebody who's killed people in cold blood, he could just repent, say he's sorry, turn to Jesus, and he's forgiven, and he's going to heaven. That is outrageous, he said. It does sound pretty outrageous, doesn't it? But I'll tell you something even more unbelievable. God's Son, Jesus Christ, took all that evil upon Himself. The sins of Manasseh, the sins of the terrorist, the rebellion of Jeffrey Dahmer, of Adolf Hitler, of Stephen Paddock, the Las Vegas shooter, and all of your sins, and all of my sins, And then he suffered God's wrath and death penalty for all of us so that the penalty could be paid. And then he arose from the dead. We're all sinners, folks. You may not be a serial killer. You may be a a fine, upstanding, law-abiding person whom everybody, including you, thinks is a, a good person. But my dear friend, if you will not repent and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will die and spend eternity apart from God in a place the Bible calls hell, while the serial killer who truly repents will be forgiven and will go to heaven. Because of the cross, repentance can transform a vile sinner into a saint, a devil into a disciple. This is the power we need unleashed in America. It goes to the root of the problem. When you lead a person to Christ, you're not just uh, helping to populate heaven. You're helping to transform society, don't you see? Let's look at the fourth pace on the path of repentance. Number f- the R number four on your outline there is restoration. Restoration. You say, but how do we know that a Manasseh-type person, when he repents, that it's the real deal? I mean, come on. His repentance could be just because he got caught. I mean, anybody can say he's sorry. Talk is cheap. Maybe he's just faking repentance. Maybe he just wants to escape the death penalty, looking for sympathy from the governor or whatever. How do we know that Manasseh, or anyone for that matter, is sincere and has truly turned to God? Well, that's a fair question. Our story provides an answer. Look at verse 13 through 16. It says, and when he, Manasseh, prayed, the Lord listened to him and was moved by his request. So the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. After this, Manasseh removed the foreign gods and the idol from the Lord's temple. He tore down all the altars. He had built on the hill where the temple stood and all the altars that were in Jerusalem, and he dumped them outside the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and thanksgiving offerings on it. He also encouraged the people of Judah to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. This is astounding. Restored to his throne, Manasseh showed that his repentance was indeed genuine. He didn't have to do this. The king of Assyria didn't mind what God he was worshiping. He could have gone back to his old ways. But Manasseh didn't just feign repentance. He didn't just do an about-face with his beliefs. He did an about-face with his behavior. 
This, folks, is the test of real repentance. If your life doesn't change, then your repentance was phony. If your life is transformed and it stays transformed, your repentance is real. Scripture teaches this from front to back. God restored Manasseh, and then Manasseh restored Jerusalem. And because of his repentance, Manasseh has gone down in history, not only as the worst king ever, but also a model of real repentance. Manasseh's altered life proved his repentance. Unfortunately, though Manasseh's heart truly changed, the hearts of his people never really did. You see, the, the decades of Mass, Manasseh's wicked leadership had influenced the nation so powerfully that his reforms didn't last. Yeah, he, he enacted the, the law of Moses, and rightly so, and got rid of all this stuff, but that doesn't mean that the hearts of the people changed. They may have been changed where they were going to worship, but it didn't mean that they changed their hearts. When Manasseh died, the nation went back to its old ways. Manasseh repented, but the people never did. And then it was only a matter of time. A few decades later, the nation would suffer the same fate as Manasseh. You see, they had to go through the same thing, folks. The people would be dragged away from Judah and Jerusalem to Babylon just as Manasseh had been, as slaves, there in captivity. They would humble themselves. They would seek God's face. They would pray. They would turn from their wicked ways. And after 70 years, God would bring them out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem where they would rebuild the city and the wall and the temple. We read about the restoration of the wall and Nehemiah just recently, well, that was after all of this. The writer of Second Chronicles, he gives us the path, the, the path that Manasseh took and then later many of God's people. It's in a very famous verse, Second Chronicles 7.14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, there's that word, humble, remember? what Manasseh did, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek. Remember I told you to remember sought? Well, here it is. They will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Help me. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Repentance. Yes, of course, this was Israel. This was uh, a promise for Israel and Judah. And we're not Israel, we're not Judah, but the principle, folks, the principle does apply. People, even very evil people, can be transformed. Sometimes whole nations, whole civilizations can be turned around when God's people lead the way, humbly turning to the Lord. Let me just give you a, a, a tiny sampling of this, some of the great revivals in history. We had the first great awakening in the 18th century here in America, or what became America. It transformed our nation. It transformed America. It ended up spreading to all the various parts of the world. The second great awakening was in the 19th century. Brought countless people to Christ. It changed America. The Layman's Prayer Revival in the 19th century here in America, hugely influential. The Third Great Awakening in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The Welsh Revival started in Wales in the 20th century. It transformed that nation. It transformed Great Britain. It ended up transforming uh, Europe and, and spread all over the world. The Jesus movement in uh, the latter part of the 20th century swept the country the 1970s. That's where I came to Christ, through the Jesus movement. The Brownsville revival began in 1995. It started in Florida. It's still 
influencing people all over the world. The house church movement in China began in the 1950s. It's still going. It's converted millions of people to Jesus Christ. It's amazing. My hope, my earnest prayer for America and for the world is for a major revival and a spiritual awakening that will transform our society and bring, bring millions, even billions, to Christ all over the world in preparation for the second coming of Christ. This is what we pray for when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the only real hope for America, folks. People say, make America great. The only way we can make America great is to make America godly. Laws banning this or requiring that can't change a person's heart. Just like back in the days of Manasseh. He changed the laws. He brought them in conformity with the Mosaic law, but it didn't change the people. Laws aren't going to do it, folks. I'm not saying laws shouldn't change or shouldn't be good, but that's not going to make the change. Policies aren't going to do that. Programs aren't going to do that. Repentance brings Christ into the soul and transforms the whole person and then transforms marriages and families and neighborhoods and cities and nations. I've seen it transform people, many, 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 many people here and their families, their marriages. My concern is that we're not hungry enough to see it happen on a big, wide scale. What will it take? What will it take to make us hungry for revival, hungry for God, crying out to Him in desperation? God's remedy for monstrous evil is real repentance. What can we do? Well, just in closing, I'd like to note some things that we can do very practically. First, pray daily for revival in America. This is an item that should be immovable on your prayer list. Every day, be praying for revival in America. Cry out to God. Yes, cry. Cry out to Him. Secondly, repent of any dark behavior or habits. Maybe nobody else knows, but God knows. You can't move forward with God if sin is in your life. Thirdly, rededicate your life to the Lord. If you've just been coasting, Rather than surging, do this. Rededicate your life to the Lord. He will hear your prayer if you seek His face and humble yourself. Next, come out of the closet for Christ. Don't fit in with, with the world. Don't fit in. Stand out. Stand out for Jesus, not as an obnoxious Christian, but as a loving Christian who is bold and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Next, make serving Jesus your top priority. Join a ministry team if you're not already a part of one. Give it your all. And then finally, share Jesus with your unbelieving friends. Tell your story. Tell how he transformed you. Share the gospel. Show God's love. It's infectious. It's irresistible. Never mind if the person seems impossible to reach. Never mind that. Remember Manasseh. Remember Manasseh. 